Hi, thanks for joining me for this video on mechanical turbulence. Actually, we're working our way into turbulence that occurs over the mountains. So here we go into the mountains with lenticulars looking at us. First off, we're going to start with uh, statistics. In other words, we're going to look at kind of accident statistics in the mountains, and then we're going to work our way into the different kinds of mountain winds. Your reading assignment was uh, Advisory Circular 00-57, which uh, talks about hazardous mountain winds and their indications. And this is one of the pages uh, in there. They did a study um, back in the 1980s and 1990s looking at uh, accidents in mountainous areas versus non-mountainous areas. And they found that in the uh, western United States, uh, 11 western states that they classified as mountainous, uh, they found that there is a 40% higher accident rate than in the non-mountainous areas. And they also looked at control towers in mountainous and non-mountainous areas, and they found that control towers, airports that had control towers, had a 155% higher accident rate in mountainous areas. And they also noted that uh, when there was inclement weather, uh, such as ceiling and visibility, the accident rate increased. So what we're going to do now is switch gears and talk about what kind of winds develop in mountainous areas. And it's very complex, of course, because mountains aren't real uniform. They're, you know, craggy and they, and no two mountains are the same, basically. So one way of classifying the winds that develop over mountains is either uh, the circulation or the winds are driven uh, by a thermal circulation or a synoptic circulation. And we'll describe and define both of these. First, we'll work our way into thermally driven circulations. Thermally driven circulations are ones which result from the uneven heating, or for that matter, cooling of the Earth's surface. With a sloping terrain, if you have a mountain that slopes up or down, um, with solar radiation, if sun, the sun is beating on uh, one side of the mountain, it'll heat up, the ground will get warmer. And since the air is touching the ground, it'll also warm up. Now, since you have a sloping terrain, of course, the air is fluid, meaning that it is able to move, and air that is warmer is less dense and will tend to rise. The opposite happens where the ground cools and also the air in contact with the ground cools and as a result the air becomes heavier it's fluid and it flows downhill so that's in a nutshell what a thermally driven circulation is and there are four different types of winds that can happen in mountainous areas and those are the up and down slope breezes and the up and down valley winds and they're slightly different so with up and down slope breezes, what is required is a really weak synoptic pressure gradient. What that means is basically there's no really strong low pressure system moving over the mountains. Basically you have a high pressure system and there are very few isobars around that high. The conditions are, are pretty, uh, pretty nice actually. Clear skies, uh, sunny days, and um, you know, really crisp nights. So uh, what happens is uh, the heating and cooling of the mountain or the slopes result in air that rises and sinks just as we described uh, about our thermally driven circulations. Now of course this reverses uh, as the day progresses. At night you get winds that tend to flow down slope and during the day you get winds that are flowing upslope. So that's what we call the diurnal cycle and the winds actually reverse. So if we follow the progression uh, of the winds as the sun rises, of course, initially, um, the slopes that are facing the sun, in other words, in the northern hemisphere, that would be the south facing slopes, the slopes that are looking to the south, are absorbing most solar radiation. The sun, you know, of course, rises, um, and as it rises, it's heating the south-facing slopes, usually. And they tend to heat up first, but you'll still have um, downsloping winds on the other side 
of the mountain, typically on the north side, because um, the, those slopes have not heated yet. They're still rather cool. As the day progresses, the solar radiation is coming in uh, from almost directly overhead. It depends upon the time of year, but let's say it's coming in overhead. And as a result, the uh, north-facing slope will also will now experience um, air that is flowing up, upslope. When uh, the air circulation really gets going, uh, if you have two um, mountains or two ridges and a valley in between, then what happens is the rising motion on uh, both slopes during the day will result in sinking or subsidence motion in the valley. This is extremely important. It looks pretty benign, but this has caused a number of aircraft accidents. And specifically, we have a faculty member here at UND who escaped with his life uh, as a result of one of these accidents. At night, when the sun goes down, the ground cools, they are in contact with the ground cools, and as a result, you have downsloping winds, or actually downsloping breezes. And then, of course, if you have uh, two ridges and a valley with the downsloping, we also call this drainage wind, it's flowing into the valley, and you'll get convergence in the valley. However, that convergence doesn't cause rising motions because the air is very cool, it's very dense, and what happens is you'll have the valley fill up with cold air and a strong inversion forms. We actually talked about this inversion when we were discussing shear turbulence, if you remember. Now, those are the up and down slope breezes. Those breezes going up and down the slope will also induce circulations in the valley and we call those up and down valley winds. So the required conditions for up and down valley winds are the same required conditions as with up and down sloping uh, breezes. And up and sound down sloping breezes, if you remember, it was clear sky and rather benign weather pattern. And the up and down sloping breezes or winds will complement the valley winds. We'll talk about how that happens with some uh, images here coming up. But also just like the up and down uh, sloping breezes, the up and down valley winds are also, also have a diurnal cycle, which reverses at night. So here's an example of upsloping winds, and you have to think of this or look at this as three-dimensionally. I'm not the greatest artist, but uh, you can see the wind sloping up blowing up the mountains, but as that occurs, that leaves kind of a void in the valley. So the winds will come in and start flowing up the valley to uh, help um, uh, give the uh, upsloping breezes a little bit more air. So in other words, it's compensating motions. As the winds flow up the mountains, they also flow up the valley. At night, the opposite happens, so that uh, when the sun sets, uh, the air cools, you get drainage wind into the valley, and then it flows down the valley, down through uh, lowest uh, areas, because the air is much more dense. Next, we'll discuss flight planning for thermally driven mountain circulations. So, how does that affect your flying? Here are four areas. And these are by no means exclusive. There's one or two other things that actually we've talked about before. But here are four things that can happen with these thermally driven circulations. And first we'll look at valley fog. Of course, as the cold air fills into the valley, if there's any moisture in the valley, such as a river, then that colder air will uh, reach the dew point if there's any moisture and as a result, the valley will fill up with fog, with cold air, reaches uh, the uh, saturation point, and you get fog. Also, um, since it's cold air above or below warmer air, relatively warmer air, then you get uh, a strong inversion. And that inversion will uh, not allow that fog to burn off very rapidly in the morning unless you get really strong heating. Another factor, another thing to think about when you're planning a flight over mountainous areas, if you have these benign weather conditions, weather patterns, typically 
the strong heating on the slopes in the afternoon will cause air to rise and if there's enough moisture in the atmosphere you'll get uh, the, the formation of cumulus clouds and even uh, cumulus congestus and then thunderstorms. In other words, thunderstorms typically form in the afternoon over mountainous areas. We call that connective, uh, convective initiation caused by elevated heat sources, elevated heat sources being the mountains. Um, another thing, oh, I didn't realize that airplanes spun, but um, if you're flying in a valley, and we talked about this, kind of alluded to this earlier, uh, if you're flying straight down the middle of the valley during uh, the day and, you know, or, uh, middle of the afternoon, and you've got really strong uh, uh, thermally driven circulation, in other words, upslope breezes are going, then you get compensating motions, or in the middle of the valley, you'll have subsidence. And if your airplane has very marginal performance, then um, it may not be able to climb out of the valley. And we're talking about you know light airplanes. When you get to uh, higher elevations, uh, the density altitude is very high. You have to calculate the density altitude. And in many mountainous locations, we're talking mountainous areas that are maybe seven or 8,000 feet, your density altitude is at 14,000 feet. And I know that a Cessna 172 probably climbs about maybe 100, maybe even just 50 feet per minute at 14,000 feet. So if you encounter a weak downdraft, one that's 50, 100, or maybe 150 feet per minute down, you're not gonna be able to climb out of that valley. And that's what happened, as I mentioned, to an aviation professor. He was flying right at the valley, right at the ridge line, um, and he was well above the valley, but he's following the valley, and he kept descending, and he thought it was just a very gradual you know, downdraft that he would outfly. Well, as it turned out, it didn't. The airplane kept descending and he could not outclimb the valley, could not fly out of the valley and ended up crashing in the valley and almost killing himself. And then also, if that cold air drainage is really strong, then a lot of times the winds can exceed 50 knots. They can be very strong, especially if it gushes through. Sometimes you'll have these plateau effects where the wind just gushes at one point. And the strongest winds typically are at the, where the valley opens up because the winds are accelerating all the way to that point. And also you'll notice that the winds change diurnally from the morning to the afternoon to the evening. So if an airport is sitting in a valley, be aware that you're gonna have wind changes throughout the day under clear sky conditions. That is all I have for thermally direct or thermally driven circulations. Next time we'll talk about synoptically driven circulations.